Merry Christmas. Welcome to worship at Broadmoor Baptist Church. You may be enjoying Christmas breakfast or opening gifts with family and friends. You may be driving to grandparents or driving to see your grandchildren. You may be spending this season alone, pondering the meaning of this day. Wherever you are, welcome. Whatever you are doing, thank you for including us in your tradition. Just a few announcements. A reminder that our church office will be closed for the 26th and the 30th and on January 2nd. If you have any offerings or pledge cards that you need to get in before the end of the year, you have three days to do that. We will worship in person on January 1st. We've only canceled Sunday school that morning. There's a children's activity at Broadmoor Baptist on January 7th. Please check your calendar, social media, or call the church office for more information. And beginning in January, you're going to be invited to a season of discernment for our church called What's Next BBC. There will be small groups to fit your schedule and only four meetings that will happen in February and in March. I cannot stress enough how important these small group sessions are for us and that your voice and the Holy Spirit in you are critical for discerning God's plans for our ministry as we pray to the Lord, who will you have us to be and what will you have us to do? There'll be more information in the days and weeks to come. This Advent, we sought the practice of waiting well. We wait no longer. Christmas is here. It is never easy to wait, but waiting for Christmas gives us the spiritual muscles to hope and trust that our long-awaited Messiah will be born in us and among us again as he promised to return, to never leave us nor forsake us. And so the longer wait continues. But for now, Merry Christmas. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let us worship the Lord. Good morning. Join me for the call to worship. Love is infinite, enveloping all that is. Love is as invisible as gravity, just as strong. Love is the seed of the universe. Love is God, eternal and perfect. And yet love is also made flesh, right here, right now.
Let's pray together. Loving God, in the birth of Jesus, you have given yourself to us. May your love be born in our hearts and your light shine in our eyes. By your image in us and your grace in us and your presence in us, may others experience your presence and trust in your love. In all we celebrate, in gratitude we thank you, in wonder we worship. Alleluia, amen. Rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss. Jesus Christ was born for this. He hath opened heaven's door, and we are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good Christian friends, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting call. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save.
Great God, our Redeemer, we sing your praises. Your glorious love shines in the face of Jesus. Born a babe in this dark world, we marvel that he generously humbled himself to bring salvation. How precious is your gift of love. Let the light in our sanctuary and our songs of praise spill through the windows to neighbors dwelling in darkness. May our gifts and offerings reflect the light of Christ and, as beacons in the night, draw people far and near closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
erweckten Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Pure, unabounded love. 
This morning, our scripture verse is from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Merry Christmas. I hope you were able to experience the presence of God this morning or during the Advent season. It won't be for lack of trying with lights on our houses, candles at church, decorations on trees, singing carols, hanging wreaths. We've done our best to create an encounter with God and with the spirit of Christmas. Why else will we go through all that trouble? Unfortunately, a lot of us may feel let down for a lack of God's presence this season. Maybe we resonate with discouraged Charlie Brown, who famously confessed, I think there must be something wrong with me, Linus. Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. Is that you today? Do you feel the way you're supposed to feel? About that feeling, I want to share two words of encouragement. The first is this. God desires to have an encounter with us, coming to us in a way that we can grasp, literally. A baby was God's idea, and only God initiates the encounter. God always makes the first move, says John Claypool. Maybe that was what Phillips Brooks was trying to get across in his hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. On the one hand, the greatest hope, the deepest desire of humankind to be at one with our maker. And on the other hand, the fears, as sings the hymn. I recently heard about a tombstone with this chilling inscription. It reads, I was not, I was, I was not again. What a statement of skepticism. I was not, beginning in darkness. I was a flickering flame for a few years of life. I was not again, ending in darkness. The fear that haunts so many is that there may be no God. And this brief flickering flame of life is all there is. Or at best, that God is unknowable and keeps distance between us. I mean, how can a worm fathom the genius of Stephen Hawking or Albert Einstein? The distance is too great. How and why would God care for a worm as I? Hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. But don't we know what happened last night? God, mysterious, distant, and unknowable, came that God might know us and to be known by us. That God can be recognized. But it was not as most of us expected. We would not have recognized God in a baby. That surprise is lost on us. We've been at this faith for so long that baby Jesus, Son of God, is as natural as waking up or getting a drink of water. Ponder this. God desires to know us and to be known by us. And so my second word of encouragement is this. God comes as a surprise. No one expected God as a baby. No one expected a peasant girl as God's mother. No one expected Bethlehem in all the world to be God's cradle. We always get it wrong when we start with our own ex expectations. God's ways are not as our ways, 
nor are God's thoughts our thoughts. Like Easter, Christmas was God's surprise. It was a gift not on our wish list. It was a gift we didn't know we wanted or needed, and only later discovered it is the perfect gift. Here it is. We cannot manufacture experiences with God, not with the largest Christmas tree, nor with the brightest lights in the neighborhood. We have to let these experiences come as God is ready. And yet we do play some part in having an encounter with God. It has been our theme all season, waiting well. T.S. Eliot once wrote, I said to my soul, wait, but wait without hope. For to hope would be to hope for the wrong things. Do you think maybe he's talking about being overly specific about our hope? After all, it's one thing to believe in God and want to make con- that God wants to make contact with us, saying it's going to be interesting to see how God does this. It's another thing to say, I want a Damascus Road experience right now. Unless I see visions, hear voices, or feel overwhelming emotions, I do not think God is having anything to do with me. This is what Eliot means by waiting without hope. To wait without hope is disappointment that comes when we decide ahead of time just how God must show up for us. Samuel Miller was in Germany in the late 1930s. He went to see one night what he called the last of the metaphysical clowns. He performed in Munich. One scene began with a circle of light on an empty stage. The clown entered and began looking around in the light intensely. After a while, he was joined by a police officer who asked, Have you lost something? The clown replied, Yes, the key to my house. And the officer began to search with him. After several minutes, the officer said, Are you sure you lost it here? To which the clown answered, Oh no, I lost it over there, pointing to the dark part of the stage. Then why on earth are you looking over here? asked the officer. Said the clown, Because there is no light over there. Miller saw more in this than humor. It symbolized the futility of searching for something in a place where it does not exist. And he likened it to our spiritual condition because we're trying to create or manufacture these spiritual encounters with God, and we expect them to happen this way or that. So we're just like the oblivious clown. The Gospel of John says, The word came unto his own but his own did not recognize him. Maybe they were trying to create their own spiritual encounters. Or maybe they had such preconceived notions about how God should behave that they missed the encounter that God had created for them. His own did not recognize him. But some did recognize God. Well, what did they do? They received God. That's why it starts with a baby, because that's what you do with babies. You just receive them. And these that recognized God were open and aware and receptive enough to let God act as God chose. And it says that to these he gave power to become the children of God, and children live in the presence of their parent. The famous 19th century preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon had an encounter with God like this. As a young man, Spurgeon felt utterly cut off from God, and he went to church looking for a way to experience God. It was a snowy Sunday morning at a little Methodist chapel. About 10 minutes after the service was to have started, 
an old layman stood up and said, Evidently, the circuit rider has been detained by the snow. I apologize, but as to keep you from feeling you came in vain, I will read a few verses of Scripture and then offer a prayer myself. Young Spurgeon was bitterly disappointed. He almost got up and left, but decided to stay. The old man opened the prophecy of Isaiah and began to read in a squeaky voice, Look unto me, ye ends of the earth, and be saved. Look unto me, ye ends of the earth, and be saved. And it suddenly struck Spurgeon, Here you are, prepared to do a hundred hard things to earn an experience with God, and all you are asked is to look. You don't have to make the encounter happen. You don't have to even anticipate how that will happen. Simply look. Simply be aware of what already is, not what you may want it to be. And that was the moment that in incarnation, God in the flesh, occurred to Spurgeon. That God became more than a word, was able to get in touch with Spurgeon's life. The hopes and fears of all the years came together in Bethlehem. And that message was a message of glad tidings and great joy. Listen. God seeks an encounter with us and knows how to do it. We don't have to make it happen or create it, but we can receive it if we'll be open and aware. Just look. And that kind of openness may reveal that Bethlehem is all around. Merry Christmas.
like to ask you to join me now in this morning's benediction. Behold, the Lord proclaims to all the earth, your salvation has come. You are my holy people, the redeemed, whom I have sought out never to be forsaken. As God delights and rejoices over you, go in peace, rejoicing in the Lord, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.